Hey everybody, welcome to Pop Culture Philosophers. I'm Rockin' Robbie Billups, and it's time for the weekly comic book review. That's right, everybody. Welcome to the weekly comic book review here on Pop Culture Philosophers. I am Rockin' Robbie Billups. It's the show where I read a lot of comic books, and I'll let you know what I thought about them, and we always start with the pick of the week. This week's pick of the week, 1975. Number two, or, or as some would call it, MCMLXXV, but it's 1975, number two, blew me away, loved it so much, from writer Joe Casey and artist Ian Mackian, fantastic stuff, absolutely loved it. When issue one hit the shelves last month, I thought it was really, really strong, great debut, really great, solidly, solidly rendered, and a very great story with great character and amazing action, things like that. It's basically set in 1975. It's about a cab driver, but she also has this enchanted crowbar of sorts, and she fights ninjas and demons and all sorts of craziness, right? Issue 2 gives the origin story, right? But it does it in such a fantastic way. It does a great job with the narrative of bouncing it back and forth between current day and the past, letting you know what's going on while keeping the story very thrilling and very, very engaging. Joe Casey's character work here is fantastic. It's amazing. Ian's artwork here is fantastic. It's so good. Beautifully rendered. Great work. Fantastic stuff. It's dynamic. It's Kirby-like when it needs to be. It's very, very fluid. Great sense of pace. Great sense of motion. Great sense of comic book epicness. This book is amazing. I cannot recommend it enough. 1975 from Image Comics, Joe Casey and Ian Mackian. Fantastic stuff. Loved it so much. This book is superb, and I could not highly, more highly recommend it. Image, actually, this week kind of owned the week. I think Image did a great job. We also have The Return of Gideon Falls. The second story arc starts in issue number seven. This has been one of my favorite books of the year by Jeff Lemire, Andrea Sorrentino. Fantastic stuff. Beautiful artwork. A very melancholy, slow, slow-moving story that's wrapped in mystery and intrigue and, and some kind of crazy urban horror. A little bit of Lovecraftian type stuff, maybe, possibly, is on the horizon. I can sense maybe just a little bit. a tiny little bit, right? Fantastic stuff. I love this book so much. And it's as if it couldn't be hype enough, the first trade paperback, excuse me, for Gideon Falls comes out this week as well. So if you missed out on Gideon Falls, you can pick up the first trade paperback, collects one through six, and you can pick up issue number seven out today. Fantastic. Just like what came before, Lemire and Sorrentino do a fantastic job of building this mood, building this melancholy, and just kind of un 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 unwrapping some of the story slowly, but at a perfect pace. Like nothing that really like irritates you, like they're not revealing things fast enough. In fact, in the last issue, a whole lot happened. This was a great setup as to what's going to happen. The shift in tone and, ch and not tone, but the shift in direction of the story. Really good stuff. A great ending. Creepy stuff. Some of the best horror out in comics right now. Gideon Falls, number two out this week. Exor Sisters. Number one is a new one from Image this week. I found this to be very, very charming and delightful. Really liked this book, thought it was neat. Basically about these two sisters that do like demon uh, exorcisms and things like that. They do it for hire. So it's really weird, it's kooky, it's fun. The art by uh, Gazelle Legace um, looks very Archie-like, but it's really fun, very quirky. A great story by Ian Boothby. Great stuff from everybody involved. Taylor Esposito, um, Peter Pantais, uh, Pantasis. Fantastic work. I really liked it. Like I said, it's it's quirky. So think like Supernatural, but with two twin sisters, but a lot more quirky, a little bit more, a little bit more Buffy and Charm, maybe just a little bit, maybe just I'm talking about in tone. A very light tone, but still very fun, very engaging, a nice brisk pace throughout the entire issue. I was very pleased with Extra Sisters this week with number one. Cemetery Beach number two. Um, the new book from Warren Ellis and Jason Howard. Second issue is here. The first issue was a really nice, neat setup. It's basically, um, we have sent people out to colonize planets. And one of these planets, maybe it's just one. I don't, I can't recall right now in the story, but we've sent some people to colonize this planet. Now, years later, um, they have their own law, their own set of rules and things like that, a way, a way of living. And now we send someone there to spy and figure out what's going on in that. They're freaked out. They don't want the government to come back and just take over. They don't even know what's happened over on Earth and vice versa. They don't know, so they send someone in to test it out. But really fun stuff, exactly what you anticipate from Warren Ellis as far as the heavy action side of things. Warren Ellis does these really cerebral, great sci-fi stories, or he does these really fast, brisk action sci-fi stories. This is one of those fast, brisk, 
dynamic action sci-fi stories, but it does its job well. Jason Howard's artwork has a grit and an edge to it that really captures um, the wildness of the story uh, as far as flow and action and also as far as, as location and setting go as well. Cemetery Beach number two, fantastic. New World number four, the penultimate issue, at least of the first part. I know this is wrapping up at issue five. I'm not sure if it's going to continue on eventually. I would like to see this book continue on because I'm loving this book. Alesh Kott, Trad Moore, doing some amazing stuff. Brilliant, explosive, otherworldly, out there, super crazy high energy artwork from Trad Moore and a really nice script from Alish Cott with some amazing characterizations. New World number four, really, really fun. It's basically Romeo and Juliet set somewhat in the future and it's not quite dystopian. It's a little Hunger Games, but it's a little bit hopeful all at the same time. It's a weird tone to get. It's not a tone that you're used to. Really like the New World, number four. Fantastic this week. Another one from Image. I got a spotlight. Like I'm saying, Image knocked it out this week. Skyward, number seven. It's the second part of the second story arc. Skyward's been one of those books that came out of nowhere this year. Took me by surprise. A very simple concept that doesn't seem like it would really be that engaging as far as a long-term continuing story, but it is. What if gravity stopped working? Well, one of the things that this writer supposes is that insects would grow giant and evolve super fast and be giant mosquitoes and dragonflies and things like that so this book's very exciting it's got some real nice fun thrilly type stuff um i think this has been option for a tv show or a movie that would be perfect for this book but it's also got great characterization it's got a great action flow to it skyward if you have not been reading it you definitely should really cool stuff right there from image comics let's move over to dc real quick Justice League number 10 with the foil cover. We're going to talk about this. This is the start of Drowned Earth. Now, they're going to tell you this is a prelude to Drowned Earth. This is the start of, Dr of Drowned Earth. The inciting incident happens right here in the pages of Justice League number 10. I love this issue. Francis Manipul on the artwork. It's exactly what you would think. Glorious, elegant, luscious, beautiful, fantastic artwork. Really good stuff. A story that really centers on Aquaman right now. We know that the Legion of Doom are making some moves. Black Man and Cheetah did some things. I'm not really going to spoil it for you if you're not that quite caught up to it, but you really, really should. Scott Snyder's been doing great stuff with this book. He's the writer. Amazing job with here. He really understands the character of Aquaman and his relationship with Wonder Woman. The artwork, the story, the epicness of everything combined. Really, really fun. There's also a tie-in this week. It's Aquaman number 41 out this week. This is a Drowned Earth tie-in. And like I said, this is not stuff, this stuff is not very much prelude as much as it is the inciting incident and dealing with the immediate after effects of the, of the, uh, the main inciting incident. But Aquaman number 41, decent. If you're that hardcore into following every niche and, and every single piece of Scott Snyder, uh, Justice League and what they're doing with Tinian and, and, and Dan Abnett over at Drowned Earth right now, you definitely want to pick it up. It's not super, super essential to the story, but it is the uh, the story from Atlantis's perspective, what Mira's up to. I think it will become a little bit more significant because it seems like Mira's going to have a big deal um, in this story. So I definitely recommend you read this first, then you read this one. This is super essential. This is only essential if you really care about it, right? Nah, I don't know. Witching Hour number three is here in the pages of Justice League Dark number four. That's my favorite foil cover of the week right now. Beautiful cover right there by uh, Riley Rosmo, I believe. Great issue. I really did like it. Thought the last issue over at Wonder Woman was just a bunch of exposition, but it was needed. Now that that's out of the way, we got a big, crazy magic battle going on at the DC Universe. James Tynion, um, Alvaro Martinez Bueno, Bueno, doing fantastic work. Everybody's digging on this book. I think it's really cool. I'm coming a little bit more around on this book. Good characterizations, a nice big epic story going on right now involving magic. Um, some Swamp Thing stuff is happening too. I feel like at first Swamp Thing was just going to be this auxiliary character that maybe they wouldn't really deal with too much. Now there's going to be some major Swamp Thing ramifications coming out of Witching Hour. At least that's what I think after having read this issue and what may be to come. Batman number 57 is here. It's Tom King wrapping up his KJ, or KJ. I always want to say KJ. KJ Beast. I should create that character and pitch it to DC. KG Beast is the wrap up of Tom King's KG Beast story. This hasn't been the best story since the wedding fiasco happened. Since Batman number 50, <clears throat> Tom King's been doing the best work 
of Batman that he's ever done. This book has been solid. It's been fantastic. This KGB story was really, really good. Had some really good stuff and nice character moments in this one and also just a nice, cool fight and a great scene at the end with Batman. So I thought it was pretty good. Tony Daniels' artwork doesn't feel as rushed in this one. Of course, he has help from Mark Buckingham. Um, there's kind of this cool little narrative trick where they tie the story like an old story that this kid's hearing. Um, really neat stuff kind of wrapped up in here, but I'm really digging what Tom King's doing with uh, Batman right now, and we're about to get into a Penguin story, I believe, and then we're going to be gearing up into, like, the, the, the return of the Bane story and things like that. Anyway, I'm really liking what Tom King's doing. Batman 57 was pretty solid. Lucifer, number one, a new book from the Sandman universe is out this week. Um, this is written by Dan Waters, who writes Deep Roots over at Vault Comics. I really like that book. I was really excited for this one. Um, there are pieces of this book. There's one story in particular about a dude and his sick wife, right, that I thought was just splendid and amazing and engaging and just rich with emotion and tragedy and, and, and hopefulness and, and love and just the human experience. But then every other page, mostly the ones that actually deal with Lucifer, I was so confused, so just like I had no idea what was going on. I think that's the point, though. When you get to the end of the issue, you think that the point is you're not really supposed to know how it's all working out right now. But in this world right now, where comic books are like 4 to $5 each, man, you got to hit me hard with the number one. And this one didn't really hit that hard, but I really wished it did. Because like I said, it had that one bit in it, that one story that was going through that I really, really liked. And straight up, the artwork in this issue is fantastic. Max um, Fiamara, Sebastian Fiamara, Dave McCraig, uh, Keg, those guys did an amazing job. The artwork in this book is splendid. It is so good, so rich, so detailed. It's got a great sense of style to it, a nice flow, nice panel composition. The artwork was splendid. The story was really good for about a third of it, but the other two-thirds of it, I was just so confused, but I think that may be the point. I don't know. This might be a trade waiter or a, or a stick it outer. I'm not sure. Cover number two is here. So when Bendis jumped over to DC, everybody was like, what's going to happen with the creator-owned stuff? Of course he said it's going to continue over there. We got Scarlet. Um, Powers is going to be coming back eventually. United States of Murder, Inc. Now it's versus Murder, Inc. That's back. Maybe Brilliant will come back one day. But we also got some new creator-owned um, things like Pearl, right? Pearl is out this week. We'll talk about that in a second. But I really want to talk about cover. I really thought cover number one was a neat setup. Really cool stuff. David Mack on the artwork doing his watercolor bit. Um, some rough sketching. Um, just experimenting with different styles and it kind of fit the tone and flow of the story in a neat, unique kind of way, I thought. I thought issue two was even better. Love it so much. The basic gist of the story is somebody supposedly in the U.S. government, you know, for the NSA or the CIA or something, they go after this this very popular comic book artist and creator, and they say, you have the perfect cover. Um, we're, we want you to be an agent. We want you to do things. Issue two kind of goes a little bit further with that, but the experimentation continues, both from Bendis and, of course, from Mac. I really got to give them props for the uh, the work that they've been putting in on this book. I think David Mack's artwork is fantastic. I think Bendis' script is splendid. I think the way they merge and combine into one thing is just such an extraordinary and unique comic book. One of the most unique comic books on the shelves right now, even though it's a very simple bendis type story, it's wrapped up in such elegance that I just really, really am blown away by cover. Cover number two out this week. Pearl number three, though, I feel the exact opposite on. <clears throat> I do like the artwork. Michael Gatos's artwork is Fantastic. It's brilliant. It looks good. The colors are luscious. Everything about it is fantastic. Fantastic stuff as far as the coloring and the, and the art go. Um, the way that the script and story is going and even the way that the, the, the art is, is telling me that story along with the script is so just not merging. It's not working together for me. This book is confusing. It's just, it's boring. It's, it, it, it's pretty to look at, but ultimately it's a boring story. I'm not engaged in any character or any part of the plot. It's just lost me. Pearl is not something I'm liking. And I think that Gatos' artwork is some of the best out there. But something's lost in translation between the script and the artwork, and it's just not working for me, guys. But cover is my jam. Pearl, it may be the last issue I read, but the art's just pretty to look at. Let's jump over to Marvel Comics. Shuri number one is out this week. We got a brand new Shuri comic. Um, she took over for Black Panther for a while. She, of course, is Black Panther's sister. Made even more popular by that awesome movie and that awesome performance by that awesome actor who I can't remember her name. Anyway, Shuri number one is out this week. I know a lot of people may look at it and be like, who cares, right? Well, I read the book and I thought it was pretty cool. I really, really did. Leonardo Romero and Jordi Belair on the art team. That's splendid. That's fantastic. Splendid's the word of the day, apparently. Um, Shuri, the artwork was fantastic. Romero, Bel Air, they just recently wrapped up work 
last year on Hawkeye with Kelly Thompson. Great stuff artistically. I really do like it. Um, Nanetti Akorafor is the writer. She does a great job. Absolutely. I do like the uh, look at that. Look at those art right the art right there. The story's pretty good. It's nice. It's setting Shuri up. Um, it, it comes right out of the coats run, but then sets its own trail and moves it a little bit forward. It's a really cool character development, really cool development in the world of Wakanda and of course Black Panther. And it may even reflect some things going on in that space opera Black Panther book right now. I don't know. I'm starting to get a theory. Maybe that space opera Black Panther, maybe that's really T'Challa. I don't know, but Shuri number one was definitely worth your time. I thought it was a really fun comic book. One I thought was even funner, more fun though, was The Unstoppable Wasp number one. This almost, made, this almost made my pick of the week. If you've been following the weekly comic book review for a while, when this book was originally out by Jeremy Whitley, I loved it. I thought it was so great. I thought he did a great job of taking the character of Nadia Pym, someone who's from the Red Room. She was tortured. She's a trained killer. And now she comes in, she finds out she's Hank Pym's daughter. He's dead. Um, everybody's lying to her about what's actually going on, about who her dad is and what's going on in the world. And she just wants to be the wasp. And she's just this most charming and adorable new character Marvel has come up with in the last like 10 to 20 years. Absolutely love this character of Nadia Pym. Jeremy Whitley coming back to the Unstoppable Wasp to continue on what he was doing when the book just got canned after eight issues. So this is basically issue number nine. It reads as such, but it also reads as a number one. It totally works if you haven't read the previous eight issues. It focuses on the Agents of Girl, which was something that was set up in the prior run. It's basically a think tank for some of the, the most brilliant minds in the Marvel Universe, young minds, especially those who are women, young women. So really fun stuff. I really liked it. I love the artwork. It's uh, Guri Hiru, Guri Hiru. Fantastic stuff. Really fun. It feels like old school Marvel. It's dense. There's a lot of story. Great characterization. And just a very charming character, Nadia Pym. And I'm so happy to see her come back. I don't know how long this is going to last. Probably not long enough. But this book is a breath of fresh air in a dark world, is what I think. So Marvel Zombie, number one, speaking of dark world. Um, so Marvel Zombie is, it's about the living zombie, right? It's the old school Marvel character they haven't used in a while. I was very excited. It's written by W. Maxwell Prince, who is the writer of Ice Cream Man. Ice Cream Man, a horror anthology from uh, Image that we're just loving right now, right? So it's Marvel Zombie, and I'm thinking this is just going to focus on this. I like the the, the using of the, of the brand of Marvel Zombie, but I thought it'd be neat. Well, it's kind of set in a Marvel Zombies type world. Not the Marvel Zombies world that we followed for all those miniseries or whatnot, but a world like that where a bunch of superheroes and villains have become zombies. And then, of course, the living zombie is there. He's got his, his little charm, and it's a nice little fun one-shot story. It's $4.99. Marvel's doing it because it's you know, Halloween time. So it's a nice little thing to pick up for Halloween. It's nice to see Prince do some Marvel work. I would love to see him do some more, especially in the darker corners of the Marvel Universe, like with Zombie, with the Living Mummy even. Um, let's let's go out there. Let's get crazy. Let's bring back Werewolf by Night. Let's give them a series like that. Let's bring back that, that supernatural horror 70s, you know, Tomb of Dracula type stuff. Let's bring that back, right? And Prince could be someone to do that. Didn't even bring in um, Morazzo and O'Halloran. That would be a great team to be putting on some of these books, right? But this was a pretty decent book. I thought it was all right. What if? I got a new what if this week, right? So what if Marvel Comics went metal with Ghost Rider? Um, I had no clue what this book was really even supposed to be. Like, what if Marvel Comics went metal with Ghost Rider? What does that even mean? It's basically, it's a story set in almost a real world where there's a almost real life metal band and they're in interacting with Marvel Comics and Robbie Reyes Ghost Rider. I don't know. It's really weird, but it was really fun. It was a great comic book. It was really, really good. I really did enjoy it. The artwork was great. Um, the story was fun. It was wild. It was unpredictable. I thought it was great. The only thing is it doesn't feel like a what if. It's not like usually what ifs are what if this decision had been different? What if this event had turned out different in the Marvel Universe? This isn't anything like that. Um, but I don't know how they, I guess they put it under the what if banner so that it would sell a little bit more, but it is fun. And so far it may be one of the best ones out of all these what if titles that have come out this month, but I thought it was pretty fun. I really, really did. X-Men Black Mystique number one. Once again, another one shot focusing on another villain of the X-Men. Um, this one focuses of course on, uh, on Mystique. Um, so it's written by Shannon McGuire with art by Marco Faila, uh, Fi I don't know, something like that. I was actually impressed with this book. I wasn't looking forward to reading it. I'm not the hugest Mystique fan. Um, I'm not a huge J. Scott Campbell fan, so just the coverage is kind of like, ah, oh, this doesn't look like something I want to read. Um, it was enjoyable. It was kind of neat. 
Ultimately not as good to me as the Mojo one, but definitely better than the Magneto one. Um, but it was interesting and it was good and it was it was cool and it was just kind of a, like a little, this is a day in the life of Mystique and this is why she does and a little bit of her motivations and, and she, yeah, she's a bad person, but is she all bad? Of course she's bad, but is she all bad? I don't know. I thought it was pretty decent. Infinity Warps, Weapon Hex is here. I was really confused on the, uh, the, the, the Robbie Rance live that we did Sunday because I was like, what is this even supposed to be? It's, it's like, it's X-23 mixed with who? Well, it's Scarlet Witch. So it's X-23 meets Scarlet Witch. Um, I have not been impressed with the Infinity Warps books so far. Weapon Hex is no exception. I just thought this was boring. I thought it was dull. I just want this whole Infinity Wars, Infinity Warps thing to be over. I was really digging this stuff when it was first starting and now I'm just like, I'm just so done with it, so bored. Venom's got a new annual out. There's also a Bill Sienkiewicz variant cover. It's gonna be pretty hot because it looks gorgeous. Uh, Venom number one though, first annual Venom's ever had, so that's interesting. Um, it's got Donny Cates' name real big on here. I think he wrote like eight pages out of this thing. He basically does this little framing narrative where some villains are talking about, they're, they're in a bar and they're talking about, is Venom awesome? So they're, sh they're sharing and trading their Venom stories, right? So each story is done by different people. So David Michelini and Ron Lim do one, so that's cool. So we got the old school, you know, one of the creators of Venom and one of the, the cementers of Venom's image from books like uh, 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 Lethal Protector and and what was the other one? Knights of Vengeance. That's a terrible book, but at least the art was good, right? So Ron Lim, you got uh, uh, James Takoe doing a, a really cool nod back to Venom, the madness, but with really cool, highly rich, detailed artwork. And you do have Kate's kind of threading it all together. You got a Wolverine versus Hulk, I mean, versus Hulk, versus Venom story in here. Really fun celebration of Venom past, present, and not really future. But it's been a really fun, this was a really fun book. I thought it was pretty cool. So don't be fooled. It's not super, super filled with Donny Kate's bit, um, but the, it is fun. It's got three nice little Venom stories. One of them throwing back to madness. Um, uh, the other one, another one throwing back to another time in Venom's life. So really fun to kind of look back in the past, things like that. Um, but I will say um, that I did enjoy this book and Ron Lem's artwork was pretty, pretty solid. I actually thought that was pretty decent. And pretty cool. But I did like it. I liked it a lot. Thor number six, that's one of my favorite covers this week right there. Isn't that awesome? So this story set in the future. Thor is now the All-Father. He's come across Old Man Phoenix. It's basically an old Wolverine with the Phoenix Force. And now they're fighting Doctor Doom. And he's got the star brand, the Iron Fist. He's Sorcerer Supreme. And he's the Spirit of Vengeance. What? And it's just as wild and as fun as it sounds. Super cosmic, explosive, only can be done in comic book type stuff here. Really great Doom stuff. If you're a Doctor Doom fan, you definitely want to read this issue of Thor. Great artwork by Christian Ward. It's psychedelic, it's weird, it's explosive, it's epic, it's Kirby-esque. And it's all on its own. Fantastic stuff with Thor number six out this week. Old Man Logan number 49 is out this week. A great issue yet again. The penultimate issue of Old Man Logan. It's going to be wrapping up in Dead Man Logan, a 12-issue series. But Ed Brisson has been doing some great work here on Old Man Logan. Good character work, but also providing a really good, just ball-to-the-wall action story sometimes. And sometimes just taking a slow moment. This is one of those slow moments. A really fun thing. It's Wolverine, Old Man Logan coming up against the Maestro Hulk again. Really fun stuff. Really entertaining. Really like the artwork. I thought it was great. Mr. and Mrs. X number four is here. And believe it or not, I'm still enjoying it. Kelly Thompson's doing a great job writing this one. The, the characters of Rogue and Gambit are very endearing and they're not annoying to me whatsoever, at least under her tutelage, right? Is that the right way to say that? Anyway, Mr. and Mrs. X, really fun stuff. X-Men fans, you definitely want to check this out, especially if you like anything involving Shi'ar, any kind of like Shi'ar X-Men adventures, you're a fan of that stuff. Mr. and Mrs. X is turning me into a Gambit and Rogue fan, and I really like them, and I hope that young couple makes it. I hope those kids make it. I really, I really, really do. Astonishing X-Men number 16 is here. Matthew Rosenberg, since he took over this book, made it a must-read. I wish it had a different artist on it. Maybe I'll get my wish on it that soon, but Rosenberg's doing a great job with the story. Really fun, really interesting, a nice little quirky group of X-Men characters that shouldn't really work together, but they do work together. So you got Havoc, you got Warpath, you got Dazzler, you got Colossus, and Colossus now post wedding fiasco is just like drinking himself into oblivion and it's kind of funny. But really fun stuff. Astonishing X-Men number 16 is here plus it's got one of the best X-Men ever in it and that's Beast. Darth Vader number 22 is here. Um, this was a really interesting story that kind of sheds some light on a previous Sith Lord 
So I don't know if this is a character we already knew or not. I'm not that knowledgeable about all the different Star Wars stuff out there. Um, much more so on Star Trek, I am. Um, but Darth Vader, Charles Soule, it's wrapping up at 25, but he's been doing a great job. This issue is no exception. I love the artwork by Cameron Coley. Soule's uh, script is great. Vader's just badass, and he just does badass things. But this interesting backstory on this very interesting character that I thought was cool. Darth Vader number 22 out this week. So Ahoy Comics, I reviewed High Heaven, I thought it was alright. Captain Ginger is out this week, I thought it was better. I thought this was pretty solid. It was a little clunky, it's written by Stuart Moore, and it's got artwork by June Brigman. It's also got a little story, short story, just like High Heaven did, a short story by Grant Morrison, with a little bit of illustration from Phil Hester, but not too much. This is basically Cats in Space, though. That's exactly what it is. So, somebody killed the feeders, this, this alien invasion came and took out all the humans, and the cats stole a spaceship, and they've gone off into space, and generation after generation, and now they've evolved, and now they're running the spaceship through space, trying to survive. And it was kind of fun. Like, I'm a huge cat person. So that's why I thought this book was fun. If you're not into cats, I think it's all right. I think it's just a little clunky. It doesn't quite come all the way across. It's got some it's got some chiseling, I think, that still needs to be done with it. But Captain Ginger, number one, I actually did enjoy it. I thought it was really, really fun. Black Hammer, Age of Doom, number six. So Black Hammer is one of those books where it's set around a mystery. And once you solve a mystery that a whole series is set around, the book either falls or it flies. This book has been flying. It's been so good. Now that everything's kind of been explained, Jeff Lemire throws us for a loop, and we have no idea what's going on right now. Really fun issue. Black Hammer, Age of Doom. Rich Tommaso doing the artwork in here. A really neat story structure, a really neat framing at why he's coming in. I don't really want to spoil anything, but if you've been reading Black Hammer, you've been enjoying it, you're gonna love this issue. I loved it. It was out there. It was weird. It was fun. Jeff Lemire is creating, as well as telling this really rich, really rich story about, about very human things, right? He's just also crafting this really neat superhero universe and just filling it with all these cool stories and ideas. And Black Hammer Age of Doom number six is no exception. Um, it focuses on Colonel Weird, and it's very, very weird. Speaking of weird, Submerged number three is here from Vault Comics. This has been a weird book, but I've been enjoying it very, very much. It's basically about this crazy, massive superstorm coming to New York City. It's destroying and drowning everything. This woman is has lost her brother. Um, she has this on again, off again relationship with her brother. Not like anything like that, but like, you know, like, like, like they get along, then they don't get along, things like that. But he's missing now and he's maybe into some deep stuff because he's taken many wrong paths and decisions through life. So now she's trying to find him in the midst of the storm. Meanwhile, she's having to literally confront all the demons and, and pain of her past. She's having to, it's all flashing before her eyes. Crazy, weird things are going on, but it's a great, good character study. Really cool mythological type story. It's very mythical feeling. Really cool stuff. Um, Vita uh, um, Ayala and Lisa Sterling. Fantastic work from Vault Comics, Submerged, number three, out this week. So that's what I read and that's what I thought about it. That Venom Annual was really, really cool. I thought that was very, very nifty. The Justice League Drowned Earth stuff is great. Don't be fooled. It's not a prelude. It is the start. It is the inciting incident. Exor Sisters is great for you horror fiends out there looking for a little bit more to read for Halloween time. Gideon Falls, you got to celebrate that, especially with the trade paperback of Volume 1 coming out. But 1975, number two, my pick of the week. If you haven't read issue number one, find it, read it, get issue two. I think you will like it. Really fun story and kind of seasonally appropriate. Thank you guys so much for checking out the video. I want to know what you read and what you liked, what you thought about it. Let me know in the comments down below. Please do check us out at popculturephilosophers.com for pop uh, for podcasts and a whole lot more. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter at the PCP Show. And you can follow me personally on Twitter at the Rock and Robbie. Thank you guys so much for rocking with us. Please do like, share, and subscribe, and keep reading.